This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. Hi, everyone. People often ask how they can support more great stories from the wild, and thank you for asking. The Wild is a joint production of myself and KUOW Public Radio, and you can support this vital work by checking out our show notes. There you'll find information about supporting my wildlife organisation, Chris Morgan Wildlife, through Patreon. Help fuel the next adventure. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoy the episode. In 1987, two men in their 20s entered the Grand Siam restaurant in Cincinnati and marched up to the cash register, shifty-eyed. Marquisa Kellogg, the cashier, she felt the hairs on the back of her neck tingle. She could read the writing on the wall. This was going to be a hold-up. Covered in a cold adrenaline sweat, she braced herself, ready for the men to draw their weapons. She wasn't about to risk her life for $3.35 an hour, so she immediately decided she was going to fork over the cash without resisting. And then, one of the men drew his weapon. But instead of drawing a gun, he reached into his pocket and pulls out a huge, squirming cicada. They thrust it at her, and maybe it was the element of surprise, or maybe it was just the shock of six insect legs wriggling in her face. But Marquisa shrieked and then ran like hell. Later, when she came back to the cash register, rattled and kind of confused, she discovered cash missing, $25. That weapon, that cicada that was in on the 1987 heist 34 years ago, was a brood 10 cicada. If you live in the eastern US, you've probably been hearing a lot about these cicadas recently. And that's because brood 10 cicadas emerge every 17 years, which is right now. They're known as periodical cicadas, the type that only come out after spending long periods of time underground. They're the neighbours you probably didn't know you had, right under your feet. And as neighbours go, they're damn noisy, and a little rude, but harmless. Unless you're a tree root or limb, you're safe. If only Marquisa had known that. In fact, every 13 and 17 years, depending on the brood or group, billions maybe even trillions of periodical cicadas emerge, a cycle that's been happening for millions of years, almost definitely before you moved in. But what we wanted to know was, what have these brood 10 cicadas been doing down there, under the ground, for the past 17 years? From KUOW in Seattle, I'm Chris Morgan. Welcome to the wild. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. It's 2004. George W. Bush is president. MySpace is the big social media platform. Mark Zuckerberg has just launched Facebook from his dorm room. People are lining up around the block to watch Shrek 2, the highest grossing movie of the year. And Usher is at the top of the charts. And brood 10 cicadas are being born and moving into their new underground homes. Now, 17 years later, they're back. And they're all grown up. Parts of the eastern United States have been gripped by cicada mania and overtaken by those signature cicada song stylings. Like this ruckus of Brew 10 we recorded in Washington, D.C. It's 
cicadas have a mystique about them. Maybe that's because they're kind of elemental. They've been around since long before the human race. We've evolved physically and spiritually right alongside them. In Japanese Buddhism, they're a symbol of rebirth. Seems about right. Plato wrote about them in Phaedrus. Bob Dylan wrote a song about them after their singing interrupted his honorary degree ceremony at Princeton. Even their name is mystical. Cicadas are magic, and in fact, the genus Magicicada was uh, was named Magicicada by W. T. Davis in 1925 because he thought they were magic. That's Dr. Chris Simon from the University of Connecticut. She's been studying periodical cicadas for over 40 years. That's at least two life cycles of brood 10. Periodical cicadas in the eastern United States emerge in plague proportions once every 13 and 17 years. When the pilgrims uh, landed in Plymouth and established a colony there, they had a really hard time for um, the first few years. And shortly after they arrived, there was a, a big mass emergence of periodical cicadas, and they thought it was a biblical plague of locusts. A common mistake. But cicadas would like you to know that they are not locusts. Locusts fly in swarms and destroy plants and crops. Cicadas, on the other hand, can actually help plants by fertilizing them with their dead bodies and aerating the ground with the tunnels they create. Besides, they're only here above ground for a few short weeks because they have a sole mission above ground, to find a mate, make babies, and die. So we know what cicadas are up to for that brief period we can see them, but what are they doing for the other 99.5% of their lives? for 17 long years underground? The answer is, they're becoming cicadas. Basically, after a cicada first hatches from its egg, clinging to a tree limb or twig, they drop to the ground and then sort of scooch and burrow into the dark, cool ground until they find grass roots and tree roots to latch onto with their mouth. And then the youngsters spend a lot of their lives feeding on this stuff called xylem. Xylem is what transfers water up the tree's root system. It's basically tree sap that contains amino acids and minerals that the cicada nymphs need to grow. They also do a lot of tunneling in search of food. And very slowly, they grow. They start out about the size of an ant or a grain of rice. And then they go through growth stages called instars. They pass through five stages, each time shedding their skin to become larger. And the fifth stage, the fifth instar, will shed its skin after it comes out of the ground. These periodical cicadas are down there, maybe one to two feet below your feet, burrowing underground, eating food, growing, shedding skin, and much like Peter Pan and Rod Stewart, being forever young. A lifelong slumber party. They're also counting, marking time. It's not the kind of calendaring we do. Cicadas don't count days and years. What they're keeping track of down there are tree cycles. Yeah, for example, hormonal fluctuations in the content of tree xylem that tells them the seasonal changes are happening, like leaves dropping. And for brood 10, the cicadas that are about to emerge, their molecular clocks count 17 years worth of tree cycles. But why did they all come out at once? It's a clever trick of evolution called predator satiation. Basically, a species has a better chance of surviving in large numbers. Cicadas don't have defense mechanisms, so they're pretty vulnerable when they first come out of the ground as squishy nymphs. They can't bite or sting, and they're not poisonous. But what they can do, and what they've evolved to do, is to make lots and lots and lots of themselves. So when those first cicada nymphs come out, it's a given that they're going to get eaten. Birds, raccoons, snakes, even dogs. It's a cicada buffet. Inch and a half long protein pockets. Many will die, but many more will live and go on to propagate their species. And so cicadas win with sheer volume. And to make this happen, scientists think that over time, these loads of periodical cicadas have evolved to emerge all at once. It's called synchronicity. This may be why periodical cicadas live for so long, too. 
It's all about natural selection. They have good and bad years. So good years are years where there's lots of cicadas and bad years are years where there's not many cicadas. And so you, you could see that this could start them off towards synchronicity because cicadas might survive better in years that have a lot of cicadas. So that individuals that emerge together have higher survival. Then you can get these natural selection feedback loops happening where you get selection for synchrony would require selection for a long life cycle. And being selected for a long life cycle would encourage synchronizing. Synchronizing with your brood equals a better chance at survival for your species. It's basically better to wait and come out with your buddies because they might get eaten instead of you. Jurassic Park was right. Life finds a way. But here's the thing. Not all the cicadas are at the same stage of growth underground. So popping out at the same time when they're all ready is tricky. We know that before periodical cicadas emerge, each has to first go through four instars, four stages, and be on the verge of hitting that fifth instar just before preparing to crawl out into broad daylight. But not every cicada is growing at exactly the same rate. So how exactly do they sync up with each other? What's the mechanism? Like so many things about cicadas, it's simple but ingenious. They built in a waiting period. So that the nymphs reaching the fifth instar first can wait for the others to catch up. Now they won't necessarily stop growing, but they won't go out, they won't emerge from the ground. They'll wait for um, the rest of them to catch up. You can imagine the more mature cicadas sighing as they wait for the late bloomers to get ready to go, kind of like parents waiting for their three year old to get dressed. And then finally, after 17 years, these underground creatures have done all they can do. They've eaten enough tree sap to grow. They've shedded their entire skin four times. They've borrowed all they can borrow. But now it's time to grow up and become adults. And when everybody's ready to go and the soil temperature down there hits around 64 or 65 degrees Fahrenheit, they get the call from nature. And she says, it's go time, kids. The nymphs start tunneling their way towards the surface, from Georgia to Texas to Maryland, 15 states in total, as well as DC. They emerge in the evening and they head for the nearest vertical object, which they climb. This could be a tree, but it also could be the side of the house, bushes, um, car tires, whatever is around. And they'll split their skin down the back, lean out backwards, and then begin to pump their wings full of hemolymph to straighten them out. Eventually, after about an hour, the wings are completely flat, and then they'll fold them down along their sides, roof-like. And then their bodies dry off and harden, and they develop crazy red eyes and cool black and orange bodies. And this takes about two weeks. And then the party starts. The males start singing their hearts out using these mechanisms under their wings called timbals. And the females start making a clicking noise by flicking their wings. That's basically a female cicada's way of saying, hey, good looking. The world is their singles bar and they are looking for love. They hook up, the females lay their eggs, about 400 of them each inside tree branches. And then after four weeks of adult life above ground, just like that, they die. Mission complete. Radio silence. About a month later, the young start to come out of their eggs. They fall to the earth and burrow. The 17 year cycle starts all over again. I can't help but think about the passage of time when you think about the story of these cicadas. They're in no hurry, maybe a reminder to slow down and smell the soil. And their long evolution is written all over them. They've been incredibly successful at adapting over millions of years, synchronizing with each other, billions of them. But they'll have to adapt faster to keep up with the changing world we've created through forest loss and development and climate change. A warmer world has meant that sometimes 
Small groups of cicadas start emerging too early, which means they lose that safety and numbers advantage and individuals become easier food. But they press on, creating new broods that emerge in different years from those scientists are currently tracking. There's still so much to learn about these otherworldly, peaceful, ancient little creatures. The next Brood 10 will be here in 2038. And perhaps this noisy little bug can even make us think about the world we hope to live in 17 years from now. Thank you to Emily Ann Vaughan, who recorded the sounds of Brew 10 for us in Rock Creek Park in Washington, D.C. We'll have links to more information about cicadas at our website, thewildpod.org. There, you'll also find information about supporting the wild through my organization, Chris Morgan Wildlife, on Patreon. Help fuel the next adventure. And a very special thank you for their kind financial support to Jill and Scott Walker, Rose Letwin, Ellen Ferguson, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, Mark and Rebecca Wilkins, Bob Yellowlees, and Paul Lister. The Wild is a production of KUOW in Seattle and me, Chris Morgan, with support from Wildlife Media. Our producers are Dacia Clay and Matt Martin. Jim Gates is our editor. Our production team includes David Brown, Juan Pablo Chiquiza, April Craig, Cara McDermott, Tio Popescu, Darcy Riggins-Smith, and Brendan Sweeney. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. I'm your host, Chris Morgan. Thanks so much for listening.